Frankenstein. Mary Shelley's classic novel is now a terrifying adventure module for any system and level. Available for download at questgivers.com. The mysterious disappearance of James Dallas Egbert III and the satanic panic, today on Dungeon Craft. Welcome to Dungeon Craft, I'm Professor Dungeon Master, and this channel is about playing the ultimate game of D&D and other tabletop role-playing games. And I'm Deathbringer. Level up your game by subscribing, and order my t-shirt at the link below to let everyone know you play D&D like a badass. Older D&D players will remember the Satanic Panic, a hysteria that surrounded a new game called Dungeons & Dragons when it first came out in the early 80s. But what precipitated these events? Well, today on Dungeon Craft, we're going to unravel this mystery. And it starts with a young man named James Dallas Egbert III. August 15, 1979, a 16-year-old child prodigy and computer science student named James Dallas Egbert III disappears from the campus at Michigan State University without a trace. His parents hire a private investigator named William Deere to locate him. Deer searches the dorm and finds the suicide notes and several possible motives, including poor academic performance, possible substance abuse, possibly questioning his sexual identity. But Deer finds something else, a pile of strange books, rules to an obscure game he doesn't understand, and it's called Dungeons and Dragons. Deer develops a theory that Egbert assumed the role of his D&D character and disappeared into the steam tunnels underneath the university where students were rumored to play a live-action version of Dungeons & Dragons. He goes to the media, and pretty soon it's national news, and Dungeons & Dragons makes headlines. It's the first time average Americans have heard about this mysterious new game that is so intense it can blur the lines between fantasy and reality. Deer explains, quote, in some instances, when a person plays the game, you actually leave your body and go out of your mind. Deer and the police search the steam tunnels, but Egbert wasn't there. Rumors pop up that Egbert is spotted at Gen Con, which began on the day of his disappearance, but these are unfounded. In fact, James had gone down into the steam tunnels where he attempted suicide, but was unsuccessful. Then he went to St. Louis and stayed with friends before making his way to New Orleans. Sadly, one year and one day after his disappearance, James took his own life. It's hard to imagine today in an age of internet and cell phones, but back in the 1980s, communication was very limited. I didn't even have a cordless phone. I didn't have call waiting. And with only three or four television channels and no cable news, it was difficult to disseminate information. You had to wait for the national evening news or the local evening news or read a newspaper. And that means it was a lot easier to disappear in the 1980s and that's just what James Dallas Egbert did. You might have expected the news of James' death to have squashed the mystery, but it just increased the mystique of D&D &D and the rumors surrounding it. In 1981, Rona Jaffe published a novel called Mazes and Monsters, where one of the participants of a D&D type RPG, believing he has magical powers, loses his grip on reality, and it became a made-for-TV movie in 1982. And again, when there's only five TV stations, a sizable chunk of Americans see it. In 1984, William Deere published a book about the investigation, and he called it The Dungeon Master. Jack Chick published Dark Dungeons, a religious track, where an innocent young woman discovers her D&D group are really a coven of Satan worshippers. And a group of concerned moms calling themselves bad, bothered about Dungeons & Dragons, is formed. The satanic panic has begun. But before we get to that, I just want to take a moment to thank my Patreon supporters who make all this work possible. If you want to support the channel, you'll find a link to Patreon below where you can get tons of stuff like my house rules, Deathbringer, and other bonus content. Also below, you'll find a link to my module Frankenstein, a system-neutral adaptation of the Mary Shelley classic, available for download at questgivers.com. By 1983 to 1984, the Satanic Panic was in full swing, and TSR, the company that published Dungeons and Dragons, was doing damage control. Enter Morley the Wizard, TSR's new cartoon mascot. What could be more benign and family-friendly than this guy? This ad announced, who needs to hang around? I've got Dungeons and Dragons. Actually, I think this ad is pretty effective and pretty much aligned with what my friend's parents thought. They knew where their kids were, in the kitchen with a bunch of other nerds making up stories. But the panic continues. 
D&D's designer and publisher Gary Gygax appeared on 60 Minutes, where he was grilled by Ed Bradley about the deaths of Timothy Grice, Bink Pulling, Daniel and Stephen Irwin, and James Allen Kirby, all of whom played D&D. That's how Bradley actually framed it, that D&D was the only thing these children had in common. Now, Gary Gygax should have responded with, no, Ed, the thing they had in common is their children who got their hands on loaded firearms. But he didn't say that. He said that banning D&D would be like banning a chair. You could use a chair to murder someone. Should we ban all chairs? It was not a good response. And I remember this was a seminal moment for me. I know my parents always watched 60 Minutes, but I never did. This was the first time. And I became enraged as I watched this debacle unfold. And I remember saying to my parents, I can't believe it. The media is lying. And there was just a pause. They looked at each other for a moment and then burst out laughing. I didn't know why then, but I know now. But the negative publicity and parent bans only made D&D more popular, driving sales to all-time highs. Sales had slowed by the mid-80s and Gygax was replaced as CEO. TSR's new CEO, Lorraine Williams, ordered a new edition of the game, one appropriate for children. And the second edition of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons was born. And I know a lot of old-timers like it, but I never really cared for second edition, even though I designed stuff for it, because of what it didn't have. There were no more assassins, no more devils, no more demons, no more breasts, no more demons with breasts, no more thieves. They were replaced with the euphemism rogues. Now, I know people will say rogue is actually more accurate because it, it encompasses a wide variety of a type of thief, but... I would argue that the term rogue isn't really a pejorative like it used to be in the 18th century. If someone called you a, a rogue, those were dueling words. But today we have Nissan rogues. We don't even think of it as a criminal. Thief, meanwhile, has connotations of doing something illegal. And that's precisely why TSR didn't like it. They didn't want their game associated with any sort of criminal activity. Fans have asked how the satanic panic affected me. And it didn't for most of my life. I lived in New York. It was pretty tolerant and progressive, and it was like no big deal. I got transferred to a Catholic school, and we played D&D in school, and nobody really cared. The first time I realized the true reach of the Satanic Panic is when I first started writing for Dungeon Magazine. My partner and I had written a scenario about an evil elf who was trying to summon a demon. And the editors were like, no, we can't go there. No demons. And I was like, really? Didn't this blow over a few years ago? I mean, it's the early 90s already. And they said, nope, no demons. You got to change it to something else. The compromise we ended with was instead of a demon, the evil sorceress was trying to summon her ex-husband, which... I guess that could be a demon, depending on your marriage. Fast forward to today. Games like Shadow of the Demon Lord, Lamentations of the Flame Princess, and Mjorkborg took that death metal demon summoning ball and just ran with it. Those games look like what 80s parents imagined D&D &D was. Although it seems silly today, back in the 1980s, the satanic panic was a big deal. And it took over 10 years in a third edition before demons finally returned to the monster manual. Thank you, Peter Atkinson. William Deere is often remembered as a media-hungry P.I. who was just trying to sell a book, but I honestly believe he was trying to find James. And he did it in a very clever way. He knew that a local disappearance of a local kid wouldn't make any sort of national news. By linking James' disappearance to D&D, &D, it got everyone across America talking about it and looking for him. I actually place a lot of the blame for the satanic panic with the media who knew it wasn't true, especially after James was found. This whole thing should have died. But they used D&D &D in a relentless drive for higher ratings and more money, something the media would never do today. At least that's what Google tells me. And so ends the mystery of the satanic panic. But what were your experiences with the Stanic Panic? I'd love for you to share in the comments below. Also below, you'll find links to Dungeon Craft on Facebook, Patreon, and my new module, Frankenstein. But don't go away, because more great Dungeon Craft content can be found right over here. I'll see you soon. May all your rolls be 20s. Dead bringer again. To me, a Satanic Panic is what happens when I visit the Nine Plains of Hell. For more D&D badassery, click on these videos.